Hello, everyone. So um, this talk will still be focused about the basics of uh, beta salpeter equation. The main part will be to arrive at the beta salpeter equation with another approach, which is doing all the derivation in the time domain because then you can describe the time-dependent polarization of the system after you have uh, shown some electric field on the, on the system. And by Fourier transform, you will get the BSE absorption spectrum. Now, the peak energies are the correspond to the various uh, periodicities of the polarization. So you have various frequencies encoded here, and then they, they will appear as peaks when you do the Fourier transform. So I will do a very fast uh, introduction. Uh, just to show another example of why BSC is relevant in a paradigmatic case. Then the bulk of the talk will be about uh, this uh, time-dependent uh, approach. Then I will talk about also uh, solving the Bessel-Peter equation for finite uh, exciton momenta, so a finite center of mass momentum of the exciton, which is something you can do with Yambo. And uh, then we will have, uh, I would like to do also an advanced topic, a few slides, but we don't have time for two. So we should uh, select one of those and we will do by, like you will vote, I think, by raising your hand at the end. So the possibilities are longitudinal transverse splitting of the excitons or exciton phonon coupling. So during the talk, think about which one of the two you, you want to see and then just we, we will see later, okay? So let's go. I just want to show an additional example. Uh, Additional with respect to what Mauritia uh, has shown before, the case of monolayer hexagonal boron nitride, because um, it's one of the most extreme cases that I can think of where uh, electronal interaction is super relevant. So here is what we would, how we would compute optical absorption using, you know, time-dependent perturbation theory at first order. This is the Fermi Golden Rule. Uh, if we had independent particles, so it's a calculation, a full GW calculation. So it's not DFT level, it's GW. We compute optical absorption, we get this thing, no? And, and then, okay, so good. Now we add electronal interaction. And uh, so the, the expression changes because now it includes these red quantities, the exciton energies, which shifts the poles. And also the optical strength is now a linear combination of all possible transitions weighted. And these weights and energies come from the solution of the beta salpeter equation, right? You put them here, you get this. And again, I want to stress, I always do this, you know, like it's super different, right? You have like a two electron volt binding energy of the lowest lying excitonic peak. So of course this, you cannot describe the optical properties of this system. You cannot approximate them as independent particles. Okay. Okay, now let's see, let's see how we can arrive at the BSC at what uh, Mawitz explained before. Using this kind of time dependent approach will be then the main topic of all the rest of the school, right? So, this kind of the first time that we see it, it will be just a sketch that I will do badly. But then, in the following talks, uh, starting with the one of Davide, we, you will see a more general uh, kind of treatment of this. So, okay, so basically we go this way, okay, now in the, in the kind of VSC derivation that we want to do. And uh, we start with the electronic Hamiltonian. And in the electronic Hamiltonian, we have, well, the non-interacting part. And then uh, I approximated the electron-electron interaction as R3 plus statically screened exchange. I made this choice because, uh, as Maurice explained before, typically um, to describe excitons in semiconductor, we use static screening. You could also start with uh, the DFT Hamiltonian. So here you will have the exchange correlation potential or with a GW uh, kind of Hamiltonian, so where the full self-energy dynamical, but then you have to make some technical changes to this in order to derive cleanly the BSC. So for pedagogical purposes, this is much, uh, is much better to start with this starting point. And uh, now we, are, uh, we know that if we just consider the non-interacting, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the, basically the, the ground state Hamiltonian, we can get the single particle energies and block functions. So this could be results of a DFT calculation or yeah, also quasi-particle energies. And then we will be interested in the density. So now we just have the ground state density, which we can express in terms of a single particle case, uh, basis. And then its expectation value just gives you, you know, the state occupations. Uh, yeah. But now we do something else with this Hamiltonian. We add an external electric field. And this is, is the, the core of it. No? Then we, will we would like to evaluate the response of the system to this electric field that we have added. 
you see here we also have a variation of the electron electron interaction because the electron so the external electric field changes the density makes it time dependent these quantities are functional of the density and so they will also change and this will give us the excitons as you will see okay this is what i just said no so now we have a time dependent variation of this electron electron interaction Okay, so now we switch to the time dependent uh, density matrix. This you have seen already, you know, for example, in uh, Enrico Perfetto's talk. Um, so we can just take it easily from the green function evaluated at equal times. And we switch also again in the single particle basis. So I will try to do as much as possible using the single particle basis. Now, the optical properties and what we are interested in particular extonic effects are given by the response of our system to the external field. And in particular here, I will consider this response function, which is the response of the density of the system to our macroscopic external field that we are using. Also, this response function can be expressed in a single particle basis, as Alberto Guandalini said the other day, now you, it, this thing will depend on four single particle indices. All these phi's are obviously the block functions, right? And, uh, and so then we can, uh, we can rewrite this uh, linear response uh, expression in this way. Okay, so um, how do we proceed at this point? Well, we start from the equation of motion for the density matrix. So this we have seen already. Uh, you, you will see also generalized versions of this, uh, but not our concern, see the following lecture. Um, so this gives the evolution of the density matrix, but we are interested in the response function, right? So what we can do is just take the functional derivative with respect to the external field of all this equation. And this will give us a kind of equation of motion for the response function. But now, if we do this kind of step, we have to evaluate this derivative for this commutator, right? The commutator of the full interacting Hamiltonian and the time dependent density. Let's see an example of how to do, to do it for the heart rate potential, right? So the heart rate potential, we can write it in this kind of functional form, but it's just, this is just the same as this, no? as you can see. But now, here we can apply the chain rule, and we split this in two functional derivatives, one with respect to the density, and then this one, which is just the definition of our response function. And uh, the same uh, kind of chain rule can be applied to the statically screened exchange part of the electron-electron interaction. And so for our electron electron interaction, we have this kind of expression. So we will see that the response function is appearing on this side. And then we have this uh, quantity in square brackets, which will turn out to be the uh, beta salpeter kernel that uh, we have already seen in, the, in Maurizia's uh, talk, right? Now uh, we are not done because we still need to evaluate uh, these derivatives. This, okay, this uh, mm, we can do, well, we can write explicitly, for example, in the case of the RT potential, uh, the full expression uh, that you can, uh, you can recover from this diagram. So you have the density, you have the Coulomb interaction. We can write it in a single particle basis. So we can also expand the density here in a single particle basis. So all the spatial dependence remains in the integral, the density comes out, and then we can kind of, you know, more compactly reformulate this uh, with the matrix element of the Coulomb interaction uh, appearing here. And um, well, another a thing to mention here that will be probably important if we talk about uh, LT splitting is that uh, because momentum conservation, this RT potential doesn't carry an internal momentum. It just has the momentum of the external electric field. It will be different from the screen interaction. So we have this. Now we can easily do the functional derivative with respect to rho because this does not depend on rho. And so we just get V. So this will be what Moritz called the exchange uh, part of the, of the Bethesda-Peter kernel. Similar things can be done in the case of a statically screened exchange self-energy, which we can uh, describe like this. I remind you, a statically screened means that you have the Coulomb interaction screen with the RPA, okay, uh, the RPA dielectric uh, function. Okay, same kind of approach. We write everything in a single particle basis. Again, here we have uh, basically we have actually we will have to integrate over all internal momenta of the screen interaction, and we get to this expression. Again, we can take the functional derivative of this. 
This is a bit more complicated because in principle W, since it depends on the screening, the screening depends on a row, like it's also a functional over row, no? But as Moritz explained, we neglect the derivative with respect to W. We consider it most likely in semiconductor so is a higher order effect and doesn't play a huge role. And so we can go back to this kind of streamlined expression also for this functional derivative. So this is the W. Uh, this is the, what Moritz called the direct term, and this is what the one responsible for the binding of electron hole pairs. No? So if you find excitons uh, below the single particle band gap, it's because of this attractive uh, screen interaction between electron and hole. So now we go back to our equation of motion for the response function, and we see that we now have three parts, no? the, the three terms of the Hamiltonian that we considered before. We have like the non-interacting Hamiltonian part, the part with the external electric field, and then the one we just uh, kind of sketched, which will contain the electron interaction. No? And we have to do, uh, yeah, we have to kind of evaluate all of those. So the first part is quite easy. So we just let the, um, the Hamiltonian, the non-interacting Hamiltonian act on left and right. You just get the difference of the uh, single particle states. So this will be the diagonal part of the, of the eventual matrix uh, will be the non-interacting part. For the part with the external field is a bit maybe less uh, easy to see, but since we want to say at first order in the external field, we are in linear response, you can replace the time dependent density with the ground state density. We let it act on the states, and then we get out just the occupation factors. So these in a semiconductor, most like if we consider that we just have scattering between the valence bands and conduction bands, one of these will be one, the other will be zero. So this will be like one or minus one. Okay. And then the, the longer part with all the interactions, actually you can do the same thing as for the external field. So it's very easy to, to finish this part. And we arrive at this expression. So here is the non-interacting part that I mentioned before, and here is all the rest, okay? So this part comes from the external field, this part is the kernel, so I call it K, but it's actually, it's actually the one that we described before. So W minus V, so this is what we have seen also in the previous talk. So you see we are, we are still in the time domain, or we did a, like a crucial thing that we know that linear response, this does not depend really on two times, but just on the difference of the two. And this will be useful to make the Fourier transform, of course. But you see, we are already going to all the quantities that we see, we saw before from the BSC are kind of appearing, right? There, there is not, uh, I mean, there's not really much else to do. This we already described, the attractive interaction and the fact that the exchange is repulsive, but typically is much, uh, is much smaller than the binding term if we have like a strongly bound excitons, of course. And uh, finally, an additional simplification, as Maurizia mentioned. In, it's a bit cumbersome to keep the single particle basis now that we are considering two particle transitions. So we just use a kind of transition basis, labeling with one index, a specific transition just from valence to conduction, right? And then we can rewrite uh, this equation. And, um, I mean, it's a bit simpler because now everything depends on two indices. Okay, now Fourier transform. So Fourier transform, we go to frequency domain. Obviously, like here we have time derivative. So from here we get the omega. We go, we get the non-interacting part at the same level, and now we have this equation. And you see, now we are basically done. Well, if we assume that, for example, the k is zero, so there is no electronal interaction, then basically this equation reduces to this, and this is just the independent particle uh, uh, response function, where the poles, where the peaks will be, are given by just the difference in energy between conduction and valence states. But this k is not zero, right? So what we actually get when we reorder all the terms is this. And this is a Dyson-like expression for the beta salpeter equation that we have seen also before. So we have arrived at the point uh, where we left in the previous talk. Uh, now, um, we, in order to solve this, actually, we also, there is an additional step, right? We need to invert it because we have chi here and here. We would like to have an expression chi equal something that doesn't contain chi, no? And this is where we get to the excitonic Hamiltonian. Okay, okay. So we can invert all the terms. We can put everything that is uh, that has chi on the left side. And if we reorganize it, already you see, you no, know, that this expression, you know, is a kind of a matrix with a diagonal part with a non-interacting, and then the electron interaction kernel is here. So this already this is the two-particle Hamiltonian, right? And um, 
So we can write it, then we can kind of uh, do a matrix inversion of all these expressions. So we have this, we arrive at this, matrix inversion, we have this. And uh, you see that this is kind of like one divided omega minus Hamiltonian. So it kind of reminds you uh, formally of a Green's function or a propagator, right? And uh, this is basically the, 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 the yeah, this is basically the final uh, the final step. Because now all the results can be obtained by diagonalizing these two particle Hamiltonian. So the eigenvalues will be the exciton energies, and then the eigenvectors, once projected on the single particle transitions, will give you these exciton coefficients. And uh, if you recall from before, these are the quantities that you need to put in the formula for the optical absorption to recover excitonic effects. Of course, in this uh, excitonic basis, where the, this Hamiltonian is diagonal, uh, then also our response function is diagonal. We can recover the response function in the transition basis by just uses, using these coefficients, which, of course, allow to do a basis change. Okay, so more or less, uh, this uh, is the end. We have recovered the, the excitonic Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian has all the properties that uh, now it's explained. You can uh, make uh, simplifications, uh, remove some blocks. Uh, it has also a spin texture if you do a spin polarized calculation and so on. But of course, uh, we will not uh, uh, spend much time on this. Uh, just to mention, you see, this is another approach which started from a time domain, uh, uh, time domain expression, an electronic Hamiltonian with an external time dependent field. And then we also describe the response function at the linear response level in, uh, in the time domain. But finally, we were able to recover again the bethel peter equation. And to compute this, exactly what you need, just quasi-particle energies, DFT or GW level, single particle wave functions, DFT stuff, then the RPA screening, which is computed by Yambo, okay. And then Yambo will also compute the kernel and diagonalize all of this, and then you get your excitonic properties. Okay, so this uh, uh, concludes the main bulky part uh, of the talk uh, with all the questions, which will now be non-existent anymore. Um, the next topic I wanted to mention is the possibility of uh, computing excitonic properties at finite momentum. So far, we have focused on optical absorption, which is done when basically the Momentum of the incoming electromagnetic field is super small with respect to the Brillouin zone size, so at Q equals zero, let's say, and we only consider vertical valence to conduction transitions. But this is not all that you can do, right? So you can uh, also compute excitonic properties at finite momentum. So this Q acts as the, the center of mass momentum, okay, of electron and holes. And uh, similarly to what you have for phonons, that you have a different dynamical matrix for each momentum. Here we have a different excitonic Hamiltonian for each momentum, and we can diagonalize, and, uh, and we find Q-dependent energies, Q-dependent coefficients. And I will, I will uh, give you now some examples. For example, in this case, we have the exciton dispersion of a bulk hexagonal boron nitride. Okay. So, well, apart from the fact that you can find many interesting features, like that this dispersion is indirect, so the lowest lying excitons is not the one at the gamma point, the one that gives you the optical absorption but lies elsewhere, also in a strange, fine structure that you can see here a bit more magnified. But these kind of things are relevant for other types of experiments, like electron energy loss. Or if you have indirect materials with phonon-assisted features in their spectroscopies. Or if you wish to do stuff a bit more out of equilibrium, such as exciton propagation and stuff like that, right? Another thing you can see in this slide is a real space representation of the exciton wave function. So that you can write here as a linear combination of the uh, valence and conduction uh, block functions, which give you the uh, hole to electron transition weighted by the various uh, exciton weights. You get this, uh, this wave function, which depends on six parameters, Ele hole position three, electron position three. Typically what you can do is you fix one of them, like you fix the hole in a specific position, and then you plot the resulting distribution of the electron. And this is what has been done here. You see, we can, uh, we can do it at the gamma point, or you can do it also for finite momentum excitons. You can see here, as the symmetry of the system decreases at finite momentum, also the symmetry of the sonic wave function decreases. No? So here you have perfect 120 degree uh, rotation. Here you don't have any more, and you have also different representation uh, from the point groups uh, of the, that you have at gamma and at finite Q. 
And you will, uh, in the tutorial uh, this afternoon, uh, you will be able to, to try to compute uh, such a wave function using, so this is included in the tutorial. Uh, finite Q calculations are not included in the tutorial, but are available uh, in the Yambo code, uh, just you change a variable in the input. Uh, but we will try to compute this wave function. Another example, still born I tried, but if I monolayer, this is an example of what you could do in terms of, uh, you know, analysis of your data, right? This is the excellent dispersion of the monolayer born I tried. And again, you can see for uh, various Q points, I have plotted, well, I didn't do it, Pierre Le Chiffre did it, but okay, uh, the, um, uh, the real space uh, wave functions for various exciton branches. And you see that by doing this, we can easily disentangle branches with different character. In particular, the red one is not what you would expect. The red one, the excitons have this uh, weird uh, shape with a lot of the electron density localized, uh, like a few wongstom uh, above and below the plane. And this is because these ac excitons actually come from transitions between a PZ orbital on the nitrogen atom and a sigma star type of orbital in conduction, which kind of is localized uh, above the layer. These are called the nearly free electron states and give you this expression. Now here, there are some crossings and instead the green is one, the one you would expect a bit more. So this is a transition between PZ orbitals in the valence and in the conduction, which gives much more localized wave function with the electrons segregated on the Born sublattice. So this is something that you could do, for example, right? Okay, so this concludes the mandatory part. And now it's time to decide uh, which one of these two, let's say, advanced topics you would like to see. So for uh, longitudinal transverse excitonic splittings, how many hands raised? Okay, there's one person there raising two hands, not valid. Okay, not so many, but let's check for exciton phonon, how many hands raised? I kind of expected, I have to admit. No, 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 this is just, uh, so the talk is over. No, we can go home. I just wanted to give an advanced uh, topic. Uh, that, uh, if you want, if you I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so one advanced thing that you can do uh, instead of just computing optical absorption, no, is to try to use the data that you get from these kind of Yambo calculations, many body calculation of the BSC, to try different approaches to model the interaction of phonons with uh, lattice vibrations, right? And this is uh, now is a topic that is uh, really, we can call it at the forefront of research. There are various approaches. No, I'm not going to explain anything really, just give you some one example, basically. Let's say the approaches mainly, we can, we can um, put them in two sets. One, we can call it this like a many body type of approach in which you start back from the electronic Hamiltonian that we had at the beginning. You remember we had electron electron interaction, but you also put electron phone interaction. So we put uh, an electron phone on self energy, which is a bit complicated because it has to contain a vertex correction. So it's not your standard self energy. Then you do kind of a similar kind of derivation uh, that I sketched today for just the electron electron part. And then uh, you obtain a dynamical correction to the beta salpeter kernel, which is given by, kind, by this expression. So here you have the exciton phonon coupling matrix elements. This is the phonon green function, which adds as the, the mediator of the exciton exciton interaction. And this chi is just the solution of the BSC at final momentum. So this we have an exciton beta at momentum Q plus Q prime. No? So this is one approach and, uh, and gives you access to, I mean, if you, derive it and implement it in a code, uh, you, can use, uh, you can use it to do first principle calculations. There's another approach which is based uh, on kind of a model uh, idea. So let's forget about the electronic Hamiltonian. We just start from the excitonic Hamiltonian, no? The one that we, that we obtain while we were trying to invert the Dyson equation for the static BSC. So we consider this as a starting Hamiltonian describing uh, bosonic particles. So we are here making an assumption that uh, excitons are real bosonic particles, right? And then we say, okay, we start from this non-interacting bosonic Hamiltonian and we include an interaction with phonon, okay? 
So these two kind of approaches don't really give exactly the same result, okay? And in principle, the second one should be questioned when you want to apply it strongly out of equilibrium. But for today, I will just give you an example where this model approach actually does work, okay? Um, yeah. And this example is related to luminescence. In particular, if we go back to bulk hexagonal boron nitride, you remember I mentioned this is kind of an indirect exit on this person, no? where the lowest lying excitons have kind of this shape. Uh, and so like um, experimentalists do luminescence uh, measurements, they see a kind of fine structure in the spectrum, which you cannot really explain by saying, uh, you know, is the usual exciton series that you compute by the BSE, and these are just recombinating because you should have just one peak in that case. So one possibility here is that what you're having is that you have these finite momentum excitons, which are recombinating, emitting a photon, but assisted by some phonons, which provide them the, mo the finite momentum needed to respect momentum conservation. So a phonon with this momentum could assist the recombination of this exciton. And the point is, is uh, maybe like you could uh, combine, okay, a phonon calculation, such as you could do with density functional perturbation theory, and uh, an exit on calculation, such as you could do with the BSE. If you, you can also derive a kind of expression for how these uh, foreign assisted peaks should be. The expression comes uh, from the approaches that we discussed before. You see, we have uh, a satellite weight, which depends on the exit on dipole. So this is the, cap, the basically the, the dipole matrix element rotated in the exit on basis on the exit on phonon coupling. This is a kind of second order perturbation theory Fermi, Fermi golden rule. If you like look at it hard enough, you see you have the square denominator that you get when you go at second order in time dependent perturbation theory. Then here you have a temperature dependent phonon distribution. You can either emit or absorb a phonon. And then you have this, this uh, you have to model the way that excitons are occupied, right? This is the, the one of the biggest assumptions that you do. You say, okay, we are in a kind of, we are, it's luminescence and out of equilibrium process, but we are in a kind of steady state because the laser is on and as much excitons are created as they recombine. Then you could kind of describe the exciton as a mod, with a modified equilibrium distribution. So the modification comes with this effective temperature, which is not the same as the lattice temperature. And then since we have such a low excitation density, we can further assume the excitons behave as boson. So this equilibrium distribution that we modify can be a Bose Einstein or Boltzmann distribution. So this is not a general thing, okay? You you have to check like if this modeling is okay for your system or not. And if you're for the process you want to describe or not. Like for exciton propagation, most likely this is not okay. Okay. Or at least you should prove that it's okay. <laughs> um, but for luminescence, it works. And uh, this is the kind of description you can get. Uh, this again is example born at in a specific stacking, AA prime. So you can get all the peaks. You can assign them to which phonon is assisting these recombinations, the recombination of the final momentum excitons. You see here we have uh, longitudinal and transverse phonons. So these are all phonons that are oscillating in the plane of the layers. And this is, uh, you have to get this because uh, by selection rules, uh, the coupling with phonons oscillating out of plane is forbidden. However, you could uh, change this kind of stacking by and lowering the symmetry of the system. For example, with a rhombohedral stacking. And now you see these kind of transitions are allied, allowed, sorry. And not only are they picked up by experiment, these two peaks, but with a kind of combined DFPT BSE approach, you could do, you could also describe those. So again, as Daniele mentioned, this is an advanced example. Obviously, it will not be in the tutorial. It is a lot of work to do this at this point in time, but we are trying to develop it uh, so that this becomes easier. Um, and with this, uh, I think uh, uh, I'm done. So the main things uh, that we that we learned is basically that for many systems that we are now interested in for our research, we need to include electron all uh, interaction and uh, the non-local part of the electron electron interaction. You could recover in linear response the exonic behavior studying the basically real time dynamics of the system and in particular using the equation of motion for the response function. In this way, you can go back or obtain for the first time, depending what you do, uh, the excitonic picture and then 
after you get the excitonic uh, data, there, are, there is, as Alejandro explained before, uh, there's some examples, also the example uh, Mar Maritza showed, they demonstrate, is a variety of complex spectroscopic phenomena that you could try to tackle when you get the excitonic properties uh, correctly. With this, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fulvio, for the clarity and for to be on time. <laughs> so, questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, how is the temperature dependence um, of such a, a spectrum? Thank you. So, okay. so this is something that is not easy to, to describe because uh, again, it's related to exciton uh, phonon interaction. So the features of exciton dependence uh, of temperature dependence are basically three, I could say, is the broadening of the peak in your spectrum could be absorption or luminescence. So depending on the, the largest the temperature, the larger the peak is, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you have a change in the intensity of the peak and a change in the strength of the possible phonon assisted satellites, such as the ones that I have shown in the last slides. So all of these kind of depend on temperature. So some of these, you can uh, recover uh, by just including, uh, uh, in some way you have, try, you have to try to include exciton phone interaction and uh, it's not always easy. So uh, what I can tell you is easier to include this temperature dependence as I did, uh, as we did uh, in the satellites of the luminescence, but it's not so easy to describe the, the shape of the exciton peak, how it changes, uh, how it changes with, the, um, with temperature. The, I don't think there is any standard approach that can do this correctly, that everybody can use like this, uh, but now in the literature, some works describing these are starting to appear. So probably you should uh, find these works and uh, so you can do different approaches. Now some of these works are fully first principles. So they, they do a kind of exon for interaction, trying to do all uh, with you know many body perturbation theory and High, highly intensive uh, HPC facilities. Some are more uh, used models, so they fit parameters uh, and they try to describe the temperature dependence in this way. And um, so for these models, typically you make the assumption of using a vanier exciton, for example, and then you couple to the, some phonon bath using a parameter, a numerical parameter for the coupling. And uh, with this, you have more freedom to describe all the physical mechanism, less freedom to apply to realistic material, let's say. So anyway, yeah, actively studied field. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I also have a second question. Um, how do you calculate the exciton phonon coupling constants? So this is, uh, in principle, you take uh, the electron phonon coupling matrix element and you can rotate it in the exciton basis. And, and how do you obtain the electron phonon coupling element? Uh, ah, this you can do with uh, a with a density, a density functional uh, theory. Okay, level. It's, it's not within Jumbo. No, oh, okay. no, no, no. You have to do density functional perturbation theory, mm -hmm. which you can do with uh, all the FT codes. I think like right, quantum okay, express yeah, yeah. or a minute, and yeah. Hi, nice talk. So uh, I had this question for the finite momentum exciton dispersion you had. So uh, most of those exciton uh, ba bands were degenerate at high symmetry points a lot. Yeah. So uh, how can we understand why is that uh, happening? I mean, what's the reason? Well, I mean, uh, the, the exciton states still uh, uh, um, still depend of the symmetry of the lattice system. So if your lattice system, its point group, for example, has multidimensional symmetry representation, you need to expect the degeneracies in the exciton spectrum. In many systems, such as a uh, layer system with an hexagonal uh, structure, all the bright excitons are always doubly degenerate because uh, that's the only representation that, that can couple with light polarized along the plane. So actually, if you have a kind of system like hexagonal bone nitride, or also like TMDs with the hexagonal phase, you should expect that all your peaks in the source spectrum are doubly degenerate. Other question? It seems not, so I 
Well, thank you, Fulvio, again.